Each face, each expression belongs to a different person. And behind each of these faces lie unique and original stories. These faces also share an important commonality. All of these faces are faces of women. Although each region of the world has its own notion of what it means to be a woman, what shades of meanings are triggered when we think about a woman who is also a Muslim? How true are our assumptions of Muslim women? Do these assumptions about Muslim women originate in the Quran? Are the lives of Muslim women really limited by the Quran? What roles has the religious appropriation of traditions played in the shaping of Islamic belief? And what should we make of the fact that Islamic practices today have been shaped mostly by men? Finally, how have these traditional beliefs and practices affected the lives of Muslim women? The lives of Muslim women have generated a great deal of world interest and debate. One quarter of the world's population identify as Muslim. So Muslim women make up one eighth of all people living today. This demographic alone is enough to draw our attention to the plight of Muslim women. We hear various thoughts frequently expressed. Islam is biased against women. Muslim women, so they say, are second-class beings forced to live out their lives confined within the four walls of their homes, excluded entirely from participation in the public arena. Muslim women lack rights to education or a career. They're not even allowed to leave their homes without the permission of their husbands. Indeed, the Muslim woman's sole purpose in life is to serve and please her husband. Young Muslim girls, so the story goes, are forced into early marriages while countless young daughters undergo genital mutilation. And when we look at what many Muslims believe and do, these negative impressions are not without support. مسایب بودن حقوق زن و مرد با خبر هستیم اما و در بسیاری از شهرهای کشور ما ای عملی نمیشه یعنی حقوق زن و مرد مساوی نیست یعنی زنها نمیتونن که او حقوقی که مردها دارن از او حقوق یا مستفید نیستن مفروض الاول الاسلام قال لنا في درجات للتقويم لو ما هي يعني ما تقاومتش فبالتالي بيبتدي يكلمها لو ما تقاومتش بيبتدي يضربها هو توفى بابا انا صغيره عمري ثلاث سنين بعدين ما كان غير انا واختي بعدين ماما تجوزت وبسبب اني انا كنت يتيمه يعني زوجتني ماما بكير عمري 14 سنه طبعا المراه وبالشريعه كمان المراه عاطفيه بتحكمها عاطفتها ما تحكمها عقلها ممكن انه بكون رجل لان حقوق المراه مش معطاه لها كتفكير انه بيقولوا المراه هي ناقصه عقل ودين المراه مش ماخذه حقوقها كامله من ناحيه التعليم من ناحيه القرارات في الحياه How, when and where did these negative attitudes toward Muslim women originate? What is the role of the hadiths, texts, which are claimed to be the words and practices of the Prophet Muhammad that oppose the teachings of the Quran in the oppression of Muslim women? While some claim that the laws and traditions that negatively affect Muslim women originated from within the religion of Islam itself, Others argue that those oppressive features grew out of forces external to Islam. Those that hold the second view argue that the real sources of the problem are oppressive features which grew out of traditional cultural practices and false interpretations of the Quran that were appended onto the Islamic belief system. The fundamental question for Muslims is how the Quran defines the nature and role of women. So we turn to the Quran itself in our search for the Islamic view of women. 
we need to explore the Qur'an's verses that describe the roles and realms of Muslim women within their families and within the social and economic spheres of their lives. To this end, we inquired of academics and thinkers around the four corners of the world. We travelled to many of the world's leading universities, from America's Harvard to Egypt's Al-Azhar. We spoke to professors from the University of Istanbul in Turkey and to those at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. We asked this select group to respond to questions that require both wisdom and courage to answer. The stories of the creation of humans involve complex imagery for those questioning their origins. Within this complex picture, we find motifs and images of Adam, Eve, the devil, the tree of forbidden fruit, and the expulsion from paradise. A child, for example, listening to the details of these stories, would then construct his or her own place according to this event. These images and motifs, then, play a strategic role in shaping the impressions and understandings of children, especially of girls. Since, so it is claimed, it is female seduction that caused the fall from paradise. Indeed, these stories often have a lasting impression on children as they shape their beliefs and psychology. The kinds of questions that take root in the minds of children are both difficult and persistent. Was woman created from the rib of a man? Are women inferior to men? Are women temptresses of innocent men? Was Eve the cause of humanity's exile from paradise? The story of Eve being created and derived not just from the Christian sources, but from the Jewish sources. She, Eve, is, Eve is not mentioned at all in the Quran. There's no mention of Eve being made from Adam's rib. And the nouns that are used really are very gender ambiguous. So there's not a hierarchy set up between male and female in the event of human creation. Male exegetes imported the story of the creation of the woman, Eve, from Adam's rib, from the uh, account in Genesis in the Bible, into their commentaries. So the effect of that was, in spite of the fact that the Quran does not actually give priority to the male as being the first created being, um, on the basis of the biblical stories, the Muslim exegetes were able to create a sense of the woman being a secondary creation. How exactly did these biblical understandings of the origins of humankind move into Muslim understandings of the origins of humankind? And the key medium that allowed that transition was the Hadith. The saying, being created from Adam's rib, is actually an Israeliyat. Uh, meaning um, uh, a, a practice or a saying which was famous amongst the Ahl al-Israel, the, the people of the Banu Israel, uh, which were the Jews and the Christians uh, during the time of the Prophet. Yaratılış itibariyle cinsiyet noktasında erkeğin kadına, kadının da erkeğe herhangi bir üstünlüğü yok, üstünlük takvadadır. The Quran makes no mention of women having been created from man. In the Quran, the key to understanding human creation lies in the concept nefsi fahideh. The Quran stresses that men and women alike have been created from nefsi fahideh, that is, from the same species. So the Quran does not understand superiority in terms of maleness or femaleness, but rather in terms of one's faithful adherence to religious practices and in terms of one's closeness to God. There are no creational grounds for male superiority in the Quran. Kur'an'da insanların nefsi vaideden yani tek bir nefisten yaratıldıkları geçer. Nefsi vaideyi Adem olarak anlamamız için hiçbir sebep yok. Kur'an'da 5 defa nefsi vaide ifadesi geçiyor. Bunların tekinin bile Adem olduğuna dair bir ifade yok. Ayrıca Adem olsaydı nefsi vaide Arapçadaki benlik takısı olan elle vurgulanabilirdi.
Böyle bir durum da yok. Arapçada erkek ve kadın için farklı zamirler var. Nefsi vaide geçtiğinde minha şeklinde zamir kullanılır. Oysa bunun yerine minhu şeklinde erkek vurgusu yaparak da Adem olduğu belirtilebilirdi. Böyle bir durum da yok. The creation narrative in the Quran is very simple. It says we created you from a single nafs, a single self, a single soul, a single person and made you into nations and tribes so that you might know one another. So there's no creation narrative which says that the male sex was created superior to the female. Both were created in the same moment from the same self. In the fourth chapter of the Quran and in the first verse of that chapter, it's clearly stated that human beings were created from a single soul, which is called nafs in Arabic. Kur'an'daki nefsi vaide kelimesini tür olarak anlaşılması bence en makulü. Örneğin Ali İmran suresi 164. ayette Allah, Allah sizin nefislerinizden elçiler gönderir diyor. Burada nefisler kelimesi geçince insanların genetik bir ham madde salınıp da ondan bir peygamber türetildiği kastedilmiyor. Ne kastediliyor? İnsanlarla aynı türden Allah peygamber yollar. Yani insanlara melek gibi veya başka cins bir varlık göndermiyor Allah peygamber olarak. Nefsi vaide de aynı bu şekilde tür olarak alınırsa bence her şey açıklığa kavuşacaktır. The detrimental social, cultural and psychological impact on women of these stories of creation are in complete contradiction with the teachings of the Quran. If the Quran does not relegate women to a secondary role based on her gender, and if the Quran does not assign her an inferior status, how have these misguided beliefs taken hold? Perhaps this mistake lies, at least in part, in various appropriations of Jewish and Christian traditions and practices, which, in Islamic literature, is referred to as Israeliyat. Israeliyat, İslam kültürünü etkileyen Yahudilik, kadim Yahudilik ve Hristiyanlık kültüründeki dini muhtevalı rivayetler diyebiliriz. Bunun içerisinde kısmen mitoloji de vardır. Bunlar İslam kültürünü etkilediği için bunlara e, umumen e, İsrailiyat diyoruz. İsrailiyatın İslam kültürünü etkilediği birçok yönü vardır. Özellikle kadınla bakış açısında son derece etkili olduğunu söyleyebilirim. İsrailiyat e, kitab-ı mukaddes rivayetlerinin hadisleşerek İslam literatürüne girmesidir. İsrailiyattan kurtulmak mümkün olmamış. Yani bunun zararları da görülmüş ama bolca girmiş ve özellikle de Yahudi kültüründeki kadın algısının İslam kültürüne transferinde İsrailiyatın çok önemli etkisi olmuştur. Toplumumuzda Müslüman toplumun entelektüel olarak karşılaştığı aydının birçok din adına sıkıntının kaynağında bu İsrailiyat dediğimiz birikim vardır. Bakıyorsunuz hadis diye önünüze konmuş kadınlarla ilgili ya da başka bir konuyla ilgili Peygamberlerin hayatıyla ilgili, işte İslam tarihiyle ilgili, tabiat olaylarıyla ilgili birçok alanda bakıyorsunuz. Orada geçen bir bilgi, Kur'an'a aykırı, akla aykırı, mantığa aykırı, peygamberimizin böyle bir şey söylemesi mümkün değil diyorsunuz ama hadis formatına sokulmuş, topluma yerleşmiş. Kadınların bizim İslam kültürüne maalesef yaygın şekilde kabul edilen işte uğursuzluktur kötülüğün sembolüdür. Özellikle belli dönemlerde ibadet yapamamalarıdır. İbadetgahlara girememeleriyle ilgili genel anlayışın, yaygın anlayışın kaynağı İsrailiyattır. These baseless prohibitions which have unfortunately been appropriated within Islamic culture and widely accepted by many Muslims have created a number of problems for women. Moreover, and more troubling, many Muslim women believe that the misogyny and discrimination they face are integral to Islamic faith. While these problematic precepts have originated primarily from Israeliyat, they have also been strengthened by the absorption of misogynistic and discriminatory cultural practices. Many Muslim majority countries deprive women of sufficient opportunities and rights. When we listen to women who live in such countries, we realize that they face a fundamental problem. 
These countries exercise conscious efforts to regulate the lives of women and to prohibit them from fulfilling their potentials. سمعت بس انا ما عنديش مصدر الحديث بالظبط عشان ااكد الكلام او او انفي تمام وانما تلعن اللي على حدود معرفتي تلعن المراه ملائكه بتلعنها ليوم الدين ان لم تغير يعني تتغير تتحصى طبعا يعني كل وحده بتريد انه ترضي ربها وطبعا بتريد انه تعيش في عيشه انه يلي عم بي اذا كان جوزها يلي عم بيقوله صح وبيرضي الرب طبعا بنقبل فيها Sadly, many women accept these distorted precepts, despite the fact that such claims clearly contradict the Quran and damage their lives. A number of disparaging ideas about women have also grown out of the supposition that Eve was the reason that Adam was driven out of paradise. Women are said to be, by their nature, sinister and deficient in intellect and in religion. Women are natively temptresses, so they are claimed to be the gateway of the devil's influence on men. Finally, it is alleged that since a woman caused the original sin, women are the fundamental cause for men to commit sinful behaviours. So, as a child, a girl is led to believe that she bears the role of evil, a role based solely on her gender, and a role she does not have the capacity to change. Allah subhanahu wa فعصى آدم ربه فغوى فنسب المعصية إلى آدم ويقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم فدلاهما بغرور أي الشيطان فلما ذاق الشجرة بدت لهما سواد فهذا معناه أنه المتسبب في المعصية أو الذي وسوس بالمعصية هو الشيطان ووسوس لآدم وحواء معا لا كما يقول الكتاب المقدس أن حواء هي التي أوقعت آدم في المعصية there is no conception of original sin in, in Islam. According to um, some of the accounts, it's Adam alone who sins, who falls, who gives in to the temptation of Satan and therefore is led astray. And in another version, it's Adam and his wife equally who give in to the temptation that is presented by Satan. So in no case, in, in no situation in the Quran is the woman singled out for blame. وَلَا تَزْيُرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى الإنسان له ما كسب وعليه ما اكتسب أما أن تتحمل الإنسانية وزر خطيئة وهي غفرة غفرت لهما لأنهما تابا this idea actually comes from the Bible and this, is, this story is not in the Quran. And the idea about original sin also does not exist in Islam. This is also not something that uh, exists in uh, Judaism. And this is something really important because every human being is born as a tabula rasa or uh, a clean, uh, clean shade or a clean blanket or a clean shade in a book. Uh, a new book. So every human being starts with a new life, completely clean. Um, and the original sin, which is therefore tr transmittable, does not exist in Islam. The belief that original sin is transmitted through succeeding generations is deeply affirmed in most Christian traditions. This idea has negatively affected almost all aspects of a woman's life from her permitted behaviours and acceptance in society to the societal rights she is granted. Although all Islamic thinkers have rejected the notion of transmitted sin, a certain hadith suggests the idea that sin is transmitted generationally for women. Ebu Hureyre'den rivayet edilen bir hadiste, eğer havva olmasaydı, Kadınlar ebediyen kocalarına ihanet etmezlerdi şeklinde bir ifade yer almaktadır. Buhari ve Müslim'de geçen bu rivayet maalesef ki 
oldukça büyük bir iftira ve çok büyük bir iddiadır. İnsanların birbirlerine ihaneti, kadın olsun erkek olsun ihanetin sebebi kişilerin kendileridir. Dolayısıyla kendilerinden başkalarına yüklenemez. Bu aslında bir anlamda da Hristiyanlıktaki ilk günah öğretisine benzemektedir. Oysa ki biz Kur'an-ı Kerim baktığımızda İslam açısından ilk günah şeklinde bir kabulün mümkün olmayacağını çok açık bir şekilde görebiliriz. Bu daha çok Yahudi ve Hristiyan kaynaklı öğretilerden dinimize girmiş, ilave edilmiş bir inançtır. Bu Kur'an-ı Kerim'in ve Hazreti Peygamber'den nakledilen sahih rivayetlerin tümüne aykırıdır. Dolayısıyla Ebu Hureyre'ye atfedilen ve bunun hadis olduğu iddia edilen bu rivayetin Kur'an'ın genel mantığı ve aklın genel ilkeleriyle bağdaşı bir tarafı yoktur. Gerçeklerle bu hadisi hadis olarak kabul etmek mümkün değildir. Mehmet Said Hatipoglu is a contemporary Islamic theologian who has mentored and trained many academics. He is widely accepted as one of the greatest authorities on the hadiths. He argues against the reliability of this hadith as well. Vallahi Ebu Hureyre ismi geçtiği zaman biraz e, ihtiyatlı davranmak lazım. Ne garip tecellidir ki İslam tenkit tarihinde Hazreti Ayşe'nin en çok tenkit yönelttiği e, isimlerden birisidir kendisi. Onun rivayet ettiği pek çok hadisi Hazreti Ayşe bizzat cerh etmiştir. Bir kimsenin kim olursa ister sahibi olsun ister başka birisi olsun rivayet ettiği hususların Kur'an'ı zihniyete, peygamberin zihniyetine uygun olması gerekir. Bu uygun olmadığı takdirde bizim hadis kültürümüzde, hadis ilminde onların bir itibara maruz kalmasına, itibar edilmesine imkan ihtimal yoktur. Leyla Ahmed, a theologian at Harvard Divinity School, refutes the claims that women bear responsibility for original sin and are the origin of all evil on earth. It's very telling to me the whole notion of original sin. It's a very Christian idea. I don't really know of it being uh, inherently part of either Judaism or Islam. So uh, that already tells one that the framework from which we are asking this question is not necessarily relevant to Islam. The idea that we're suffering from original sin, women caused it, uh, is a, con a construction, really. So we, need, we don't need to be thinking about that. In order to understand the teachings of Islam in today's modern world, we must first look at the geography and the era in which the Quran was first revealed in the 600s AD. We must understand the status of women in Mecca prior to Islam, as well as the changes that the rise of Islam brought to the lives of women. So what we learned was uh, the situation was there was a lot of oppression of women within the context of before Islam came. So what we learned was also that uh, women were treated as property and they're not treated equally with men, they can't own property, they are not independent and there's a lot of uh, degradation or humiliation towards women before Islam came. So um, we also learned that when Islam came, the women were basically liberated, uh, recognized as an independent entity and all are servants before God. Hazreti Ömer, kadınlara karşı çok şiddetli, bütün kadınların korktuğu bir erkek. O söylüyor, diyor ki, peygamberin sağlığında, yani biz gelinlik olarak zaten Mekke'de kadınlara değer vermezdik. Medine'ye gelince o biraz değişti. Biz korkardık ki kadınlar hakkında ileri geri konuşursak hakkımızda bir ayet iniverir. Sonra biz <gülüyor> rezil oluruz. Onun için diyor, peygamber yaşadığı sürece biz kadının aleyhinde hiçbir şey söylemedik. Onları mümkün olduğu kadar hoş tuttuk. Ama peygamberin vefatından sonra 
eski halimize döndü. Kur'an'ın indirilmeye başlandığı çağ uzandığımız zaman, kadınların durumlarına baktığımız zaman her şeyden önce onların hukuki bir şahsiyet olmadıklarını, evlenme, boşanma, miras, mal mülk edinme, ticaret, mülkiyet hakları konusunda, eğitim, öğretim hakları konusunda birçok sıkıntıları olduğunu, baskı altında olduklarını, haklarının kısıtlanmış olduğunu görmekteyiz. Mülkiyet hakkı elde etmek, ondan sonra mehir almak ve boşanmada, evlenmede kadının da söz sahibi olması İslam'ın kadına getirdiği en önemli devrimdir. Aslında belki basit gibi algılanabilir ama zaten asıl kırılma noktası burasıdır. Yani kadının ikinci sınıf gözükmesinin önündeki en önemli engel hukuki statüsü, mülkiyet edinmesi ve mutlaka eşinin söylediklerinin dışına çıkamayacağına dair algının kırılmasıdır. İslam bu noktada kadına büyük özgürlük alanı açmıştır. E, boşanmadan alınız, mülkiyet edinmeye kadar edin, edinmeye kadar birçok konuda e, kadın e, daha e, hukuki bir e, haklar elde etmiş diyebiliriz. The Quran's claim that men and women are equal was a major conceptual innovation for that period. The Quran addresses women directly, guarantees their rights within a legal framework and introduces new laws safeguarding them. Kur'an-ı Kerim ya eyvellezine amen dediği zaman ey iman edenler dediği zaman bunun içerisine iman eden kim varsa orada kadın, erkek, çocuk, yaşlı, genç hepsi kapsamına girmektedir. Dolayısıyla bu görüşleri doğru kabul etmemiz söz konusu olamaz. Her dilin olduğu gibi Arapçanın da kendine özgü gramatik kuralları vardır. Burada Kur'an-ı Kerim'in yani Arapçadan gelen, kaynaklanan bu özelliğinden dolayı e, genele hitap ettiği zaman erkek zamir kullanılır. Mesela ya eyyühel müminun der, ya eyyühel müslimun der. Dolayısıyla burada erkek ifadesi kullanılır. Müminun derken Erkek müminler size hitap ediyorum, kadınlar de size etmiyorum, kastetmiyor. Özel olarak eğer kadınlardan bahsedilecekse işte o zaman özele iner ve dişil zamirler kullanılır. Dolayısıyla Kur'an-ı Kerim'in geneline baktığımız zaman Ya eyyühen nasu, ya eyyühel müminune diye çok sayıda ayeti kerime kadına, erkeğe toptan hitap eder. Ve hükümlerde de kadın ve erkekler eşit şekilde muhatap alınır. Bundan dolayı Kur'an-ı Kerim'in e, bu üslubu her dilde olduğu gibi Arapçaya özgü bir üsluptur. Um Salama, one of the wives of the Prophet. And she goes up to Rasulullah, she goes up to the Prophet of God and she says, why is it that the Kur'an doesn't address women? And he did not have an immediate, immediate answer for this. And then uh, according uh, to the scholar Atabari, it was actually the same day uh, during khutbah uh, that the Prophet peace be upon him got a new revelation and it was uh, Quran 3335 um, saying, oh you believing men and believing women, you um, noble men, noble women, uh, fasting men, fasting women, um, honorable men, honorable women, um, you men who are performing good deeds and oh you women are, who are performing good deeds. The other principle is that God says in the Quran or the Quran says that women and men or men and women are each other's awliya, that men and women are each other's awliya, both of whom have the responsibility to enjoin the good and to forbid the wrong. And so women and men are not distinguished again in the Quran in terms of moral personality or the responsibility to act morally on earth. Because the Quran is speaking about the believers, it is speaking about the women and the men. عندما يتحدث عن المسلمين يتحدث عن الرجال والنساء عندما يخاطب الناس يخاطب الرجال والنساء ومصطلح رجل ورجال ورد في القرآن ثمانية وخمسين مرة وذكر ورد في القرآن إستي عشر مرة أي المجموع سبعين مرة 
بينما امرأة وردت 26 مرة أم وأمهات وردت 36 مرة أنثى وردت 30 مرة المجموع 92 إذا الحديث عن المرأة عن الأم والأمهات والأنثى أكثر من الحديث عن الرجل والرجال والذكور A strict, literal and holistic reading of the Quran is a much more liberating reading. And I say holistic, when I say that, what I mean is reading the whole text, every verse of the Quran in relation to all of the other verses of the Quran. And when I say literal, I mean literal in a sense of looking at the roots of the Arabic words, the meanings of the roots of the Arabic words, and what those actually say, not necessarily the connotations that people give them later. According to Quran experts, additions, extremist interpretations, and ignoring the Quranic verses are the sources of the current problems concerning the development of Muslim life, raising several key questions. How can we understand whether or not a hadith is authentic? What kind of an approach should be followed when a hadith contradicts a verse of the Quran? To what extent have the current conditions of women been affected by the fact that all hadiths, interpretations and canonical jurisprudence books have been written by men? Does the Quran itself include commandments and prescriptions that prohibit women's active participation in social life and flourishing as a human being? In the second episode of this documentary, we seek answers to all of these questions.